All right, so I'll work out. Um, uh, let's bring uh, Ann. I'm going to apologize before I really get into this. Uh, I got no sleep last night. I don't know why. Um, so I'm probably going to talk about furry hamsters that are dancing across my monitor because I'm seeing things right now. But I'll try to I'll try to be as witty as I can and cover the uh, material um, adequately. If I miss something, feel free to raise your hand and I'll try to address your concerns. Hopefully, without making a fool of myself. So, why am I doing this? Why high uh, high availability with Postgres and PageMaker? Um, and all the little things in between. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover DRBG, Coral Sync, LVM. There's so many different parts in here. It's a giant, giant stack of stuff. Um, and it really is pretty involved. Uh, I had to spend weeks going over this myself just to make sure I didn't screw it up just for the presentation. Um, learning it was ridiculous. And I'm not going to exaggerate that you'll make a lot of mistakes when you try and set this up. And um, that's just the way it is. It's a big stack of stuff, especially with PageMaker. It's very, very simple. But when you get it working, it's worth every dime. Well, it's free, so I guess I'm not paying a dime for it, but so again, this is me. It's a really old picture. Ignore it. So what do I mean when I talk about high availability? It means the ability to stay online. In the context that I'm talking about here, uh, I want my database to be up as much as possible, no downtime ever. And if it does go down, I want to be able to bring it back up instantly. Uh, I don't want to have to scramble to find some hardware in another cabinet somewhere. I don't want to have to spin up some nodes to you know wait for them to boot. I want it just to be back up again. Again goes back into um, surrounding the hardware for you. But uh, the other thing you get with this is I don't want transaction logs. One of the things Postgres gives you with the transaction log files, your xlog directory, your replication, and hot, warm, hot standbys, warm standbys, all the different ways they give you to protect your data is it's really, really hard to lose it if it actually is written to disk like it's supposed to be. But there are exceptions, um, like when you lose an entire machine. Um, if you're exporting a transaction log, do you really know they got to the other machine? Do you know your replication's working the way it's supposed to? So there's lots of different ways you can do replication. Um, there's probably more than the six, you know, half dozen I'm going to talk about. Um, so you know, there's the basics, the trigger-based ones, Sloney, Bucardo. You basically copy one table or even just some select statements across to another node. But, you know, you're not really copying everything. And it's only based on what the tool does. So you could lose something like that. Especially on a highly transactional system where you're handling thousands, tens of thousands of transactions a second. Really good opportunity there to lose your data. Not what you want. Uh, multicast, something you have with PG Pool. Same problem. Um, there's just an inexact data transfer. It'll do your job. Um, it's great for reporting. It's great for spreading the load, making you know sharding, lots of different neat things there. But if you really want to make sure you don't lose any data, financial data, not quite up to the task. Um, I know that someone here from um, Unova is going to disagree with me on that because they're from Canada. I'm not going to get into that right now. I'm just trying to focus on my group. Um, and of course, we have log shifting. I mean, way back in the old days, 7.2, you know, all the old stuff, that's how you got your data to a new server. You took the actual data files that were going to be applied to your data, to your graphical data, send those somewhere else to be replaced. That's great. It's awesome. But transaction files that are in the middle of being written, your machine goes down, gone. And you also have your polling machine. So, I mean, there's just a lot of opportunity to be lost. Asynchronous is the same way. It asks for the data, master sends it. If you don't ask, you don't get it. And there's also no verification that they, that they actually made it safe to go to a new node. Again, you could lose data. And again, 
it's not going to be available immediately. When you uh, want to flip a switch to become a full master again. Wow, so we have 9.1, synchronous replication. The holy grail that we've, uh, we've been waiting for for, what, a decade? So there's a couple of things that uh, we, it isn't really heavily advertised about Postgres synchronous replication. It is synchronous. We send the data, the data file over, the transaction is saved. It doesn't get written to the master until it gets acknowledged by at least one server. Great. But it doesn't get replayed on the CRE either. The guarantee is only that it makes it to the CRE, not that it's actually processed there. So you again have some opportunity for something to happen so that that data doesn't actually get replayed properly. The other problem you have is currently, this may not be the case in future versions or you know, you can find ways around this by restarting Postgres, but currently the default with the master is if a slave dies, Postgres dies too. Well, if it didn't die, just wait until it can get a slave to acknowledge the fact that it's writing data. Because it wants to guarantee that that data is safe. And the only way to guarantee, guarantee that data is safe is if it gets written to the CRE to begin with, right? So in order to get that, they won't let you write a transaction unless it's being written to the CRE. Pretty simple. But if you have a highly transactional system that's handling 10, 20,000 transactions a second, that will kill you. Even one second of lag, because your slave hiccups when a net, there's a network hiccup, or a slave goes down and it's rebooting because you're doing some maintenance on it, you have to monitor and then restart Postgres with a new config setting that says, don't wait for the synchronous transaction for just you know a few minutes while we're rebooting and doing maintenance to the server or whatever. That's all stuff you have to manage manually. Currently, there's this is all new stuff, so we're you know we're, we're finding new ways to work around it. But you know these are all little things you kind of have to think about when you're implementing these new things. So there's a tool that's kind of been around for a while that can solve some of these problems while introducing its own, but we'll take the caveats as they come and uh, try to not get too far into it. So what DRBD is, is it stands for Distributed uh, Replicating Block Device. What that is, is basically a network RAID 1. So a RAID 1 is a mirror. Data here, data here. Okay? If, unlike the synchronous replication with Postgres, if node 1 dies, node 2 still has your data. So it's going to run just like and it's underneath the file system. So Postgres doesn't even see it happening. It just sees, oh, my block device is still there. The main difference here, though, is these block devices are going to be on different servers. Why on different servers? Well, one server dies, your data is still safe on the other. Now, how DRBD works is on the default setting, data is not synced. If you call an F-sync, to tell a disk to write the data. An F-sync is not successful until it comes back from both systems. This is on the block level. Every eight kilobytes, or whatever your default is to your file system, it will not say that data is successfully written until it is successfully written to both systems. So what does this give you? Well, if data is written to node A, you can guarantee it's been written to node B. If node A dies, Node B, if you're running in, um, in a, as a hot master, it just, you just gotta restart so that it's back in writable mode. If you're doing a warm standby, it's just like a recovery. Um, actually, no, I'm being silly. Okay, so it's not mounted. The file system is not mounted at this point. It's only been mounted on one, right? So it goes down. One of the jobs that Pacemaker does is it shows, it monitors it this whole time. and it, says, okay, DRBD, it's time that node A died. I'm going to bring all this stuff up on node 2. So it mounts it, brings it back up, and starts it. This is the same thing of what would happen is if you restarted node A. All the same data is there. It's not doing a, uh, you don't need recovery.com. It's basically just starting a fresh node like it had just crashed. A little bit safer. And there you go. 
hidden from PC. PC doesn't even know it's happening. It's just it's below the file system, so even the operating system doesn't know that it's there. The other thing that it gives you is your synchronization is automatic. So remember I mentioned node A died? Node C took over? Node D took over? When node A comes back, it's, even if you've been writing data to this one, it keeps a data map on both systems. So it knows which data has changed. So it'll actually resync all that data that's changed back over to node when it reappears. This data could be all of the data. They reformatted the system, right, you know, put a brand new system in because the other one was completely dead and it was on fire or something. The new node would start from scratch. The old node would catch up. But it does this automatically as soon as it connects. It kind of runs in a degraded mode. Um, it's kind of like you're in RAID 1. Your RAID 1 would say, I'm in degraded mode, don't really depend on this data until you get another disk in here. Well, it's the same thing. Um, there's, a, there's a status thing you can check that will actually say, well, I'm in degraded mode, don't really depend on me until you get the other node back up. So it's a pretty handy thing to have. But why pay so much? The really important stuff. Um, you don't want to have to be there watching your nodes all the time. It's obvious that there's a lot of commands involved to remounting a file system. If you have LVM started, you've got to rescan all your file systems to make sure they show up. Then you've got to mount them. Then you've got to start Postgres. Then you've got to start all the independent services, like if you have a CG agent running or you know Sloan or River Tar, or you've got to start all that up. No, it'll do it for you. And um, it's pretty fast. Like it used to be uh, on my VM, and VMs are slow, right? It's about uh, 10, 20 seconds is what you're going to wait getting a system back up online. And uh, this will probably come up. Why Pacemaker instead of something like uh, Red Hat Cluster? Or uh, there's another product out there called uh, Lifekeeper from a company named Sios. Um, it's a kind of a commercial entity that does a similar thing like this. And um, there's really no reason. Um, I like to think about it that the Red Hat Cluster Enterprise Manager is kind of center one, the Red Hat you know, life cycle. So if you want to kind of separate yourself from that and actually have a more agnostic tool, Pacemaker is probably the best choice. Um, yeah? Oh yeah, so I'm going to actually get into that when I get into the actual presentation because I'm actually going to build a cluster for you live. I've got two VMs running on my system right now and that's why I was kind of screwing around with my uh, my nodes over here. This is node uh, two, this is node one, and I've got a handy little you know, cut and paste sheet over here for my commands. So, <laughs> what, 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 how this will actually work, uh, it's the very end of this, um, we're, we have a virtual IP, right? And the virtual IP uh, will also be handled by Pacemaker, and it will point to the you know, active live node. Then when you would just point to that, Say I've got 192.168.56.30.10 is node one, dot twenty is node two, and dot thirty is the cluster. Obviously, you don't have to use that naming scheme. I just threw this together for the presentation, um, but it kind of leaves you open to do uh, a lot of different things. Um, another thing I like to point out while I'm actually got this with me is that uh, VRBD and Pacemaker will generally, if you have a, a, some bigger iron hardware, uh, will generally operate on their own ten gig e which is like the interface between two machines. That way you don't really step on other traffic that's in and out of the machine, and all the synchronizations between the two machines will be as fast as possible. Because remember, this is block level traffic. You don't really want any kind of latency in there. Definitely wouldn't recommend it for an Amazon DPS. So this is an overview of what I'm going to be building. It's a basic two node cluster. Uh, I'm, I probably could have put this on you know, Zen or some other VM. I'm putting it on VirtualBox because that's what I'm used to. It's really easy to set up. Um, maybe later I'll kind of pick up the more open source tools. Um, regular old Ubuntu 12.04 LTS. Why 12.04? Because it just came out. Um, it's something people are going to be familiar with because it's Ubuntu. And it's a long-term stable, so theoretically it'll actually have some good support for many of you. And the other reason is it's really recent. So a lot of the recent tools we want Recent versus Pacemaker, recent versus VRBD, recent versus Colosim, they're all easy. 
and they're all out of the box. I can just run a quick command, install them, they're there, and you can just use them. Um, a few configuration files are done. Uh, I actually, what I did is I, geez, I added another um, device to these VMs just for the Postgres stuff. Uh, I put it kind of in there as SVG, so SV stays for regular, you know, the OS and all that other stuff. And then SVG is a 500 meg partition just for Postgres for our you know, PE bench partition. So that's going to be our external bucket. And the reason I did this way is because you're probably going to do that yourself, uh, whether it's like you know, um, like SAN or NAS or some kind of external device, or you're going to use a uh, um, if you have uh, an NVRAM card like NVMe/O or you know a RAM SAN, that's going to be two things you're going to see in the machine that will be in the machine when you're done. So you could really use a shared um, RAID device that way. So it's not completely common, but something you'll probably run into if you live around one long enough. Um, and then Postgres 9.1 straight from the Ubuntu repo. Um, again, I probably could have used the ones you know, supplied from Postgres themselves or did a compile and install. You know, for this purposes, just install from the repo. It's, it's all cut and pasted. It's worked done it plenty of times. Um, and then DRBD and Pacemaker also from the repo. Again, because they're most recent version, well, they're not the most recent version, but they're recent enough for us to use. So there's a few things about um, DRBD and LTP. So DRBD is a handy dandy little thing to have around, but um, LVMs and DRBD are kind of kernel level modules, so they can't really like each other all that much. So you've got to tell LVMs to ignore DRBD. So one of the things you have to do on each of your nodes uh, the other thing is I'm going to be root on these because that's just you know like 90% of the commands I'm going to run are root so So these lines here, get rid of that filter. I'd like to point out that um, this line basically tells LVM what it should watch, like what it actually has domain over. Um, and those R lines basically tell it to remove those objects. So remember how I said DevSVG is going to be dedicated to DRBD? I don't want LVM to manage that device because then it will conflict with DRBD and they won't know who really owns it. It will cause a bunch of screw ups and it's just better to tell it to ignore it. The other things I told it to ignore, dev this, dev block, those are because those are lots of aliases that could also point to a dev SVG. Um, and that final one just says add everything else. And that's there because DRBD, um, there will be, be a device called dev DRBD0 that will appear and disappear pretty much at will. And we want LVM to catch that one because that's the one where the actual data is. The other major thing we're going to do is this write cache stat, uh, this write cache state. We're turning that off. Uh, the reason for that is, like I said again, the DRBD device will disappear and reappear based on which node the DRBD thinks is going to be live and active with the data. So we don't want LVM to catch that because it could be wrong at any point in time. We want to rescan it every time back to one of the other bytes. A few milliseconds of time, not really going to hurt anything. I'm not going to change the boot times. Um, and that's on both nodes. We want, you know, this, this is for machines level state. The other thing we have to do is after we make those two changes is when Linux boots, um, it actually boots off kind of a RAM drive that has a past state of all the little bits and pieces so that it can actually get a hold of it before it boots the OS prop. Well, clearly the first time it booted, LVM stole all the devices it could because DRBD is not really a default server. So what ends up happening is these two things I just did are ignored until I reboot again. So, and also the rebooting state is cached. So I want it to regenerate that cache. And again, that goes on both nodes. So I'm going to go ahead and do that real quick. And while that's running,
So when I say install tools here, I'm just basically, you know, AppCAD, if you're using uh, Red Hat, use Yum, install. Um, there's a package called DRBD8 uh, Details. And DRBD is actually integrated with the kernel. It comes by default, it's in the kernel itself. It's gonna be there, but the tools that actually manage it and control it are not. They're not a default thing. So if you wanna actually say, okay, DRBD, add this device, or make this device, or do this thing, you need to add the tool. Um, I'm not actually gonna have that command in there, but it is in my slides. So all the commands in here that I actually have um, for actually installing the services, and those are all in there. I don't know if I have like a live network service or anything at all, and I basically have installed it, but I left that part out. You need to pre installed on the patch notes as well. Um, you know, once that's there, it becomes actually configured. Oh, there you go, my app cat. That's how you get it for uh, MVV. There be the eight details. Um, and now what we're going to do is there's this uh, file we need to create that actually will configure how DRBD will work. Um, in this case, I think I already have it. Okay. So this is basically just kind of like a template of which node is which. So you'll notice I've got my high availability in node one and node two, my dot ten dot twenty, like I mentioned before. And um, the sinker rate part is just a default I like to put in there for handy dandy purposes, because the default I think is SHA1 or some other default that's a little bit lower. Um, and it's mostly just so it can, um, the, the checksum it uses when it's actually syncing data um, verifies each block is the same. Um, so the faster checksum is generally going to win. And then we have our disk SVG, right? So the other thing we're going to do, and this is true about Ubuntu, and it's probably true about Red Hat also, although the commands are different. With uh, Ubuntu, it's, um, I forgot the checks you do something. Um, but you need to basically tell it so that you don't want DRB to start when the machine boots. Pacemaker will do that for you. If it starts when the machine boots, it could be in a different, you know, it could be in a different state. It could try to steal the device from Pacemaker, which is, we definitely don't want. So we're just gonna tell DRBD not to start because we hate it. That's for pacemaker. All right. So next thing we do is we actually create the DRBD stuff. And really, you know, there's just, it, it really at this point is just that simple. I mean, I, I can't really explain it. You create the device and then you turn it on. That's create an L. Have DRBD devices. Handy. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to set it up so that node one is going to be the primer on all these things. So that way I know that when I'm doing my experiments, my cut and paste work. Um, node one is going to be our primary. So, what this command actually does, this command is actually much easier in, in DRBD 8.4. Uh, 8.3 is kind of crusty syntax. And actually, I wanted to mention that because if you actually go and look at the DRBD site, they default to 8.4 syntax. And they say, like, if, you use, if you're using 8.3, which currently everything does unless you actually physically install 8.4 on your own, um, you actually have to go to a separate set of documents. And I think this one might be the one that's wrong. That one needs to be on the primary.
So it's running on both nodes, it's set up. And one of the things you can see here is it doesn't know which node is primary, and because they're both secondary, they're both there. Um, Proc Video gives you a very handy thing so it always tells you what is kind of going on. The Proc File System is awesome. So back to our command that we were going to say the primary. Obviously, I left the command out of here. You have to actually start the DBD server to use it. So, okay, only do this on node one. We want a primary node. Okay, so what I just did is I'm following this sync process it's initializing and syncing that to the other node. So basically it's saying, all the data on node two is bull crap. I'm just gonna replace it all with a synchronization and now it's done. So now we have a primary and a secondary and they're both up to date. And that's the status we need. Um, and if you're playing with DRBB, the interesting thing is um, the first node, that you're, the node you're on, is always the first, the first uh, element there. So if I go to node two, Notice it says secondary primary. Because you're on node two, the first thing is the node you're on. The second one is the remote node. That's probably an important thing to know. All right, so what do we do next? There's a lot of these options in this default file here. Um, they're basically just all the different settings you can turn on and off. Well, some of these are very relevant to your life. So disk barriers, you know, they're, they're write barriers. They're, some file systems have them, some systems don't. But what it basically boils down to, along with uh, our disk flushes uh, here, is there's certain integrity things that, this, that the file system says it's able to do. And DRBD knows they're there. And if some of these things aren't, you know, honored, then you're not going to get your data written properly. And you can turn these off if you have a battery backed cache because it will actually check your data for you. Um, it'll make sure that the barriers are in place. It'll make sure that your data is written in proper order. But the thing you should never, ever turn off, ever, and I'm not even sure why this is an option, is disk drain. Uh, that's something that if you really are an expert, you might be able to play with, but really don't. Um, that's something that should never be disabled because what disk drain does is it says, okay, I'm gonna use this data in this order. Write it in this order. Because it basically drains it, you know, like a, like a, like a FIFO. But, um, sorry, like a FIFO. So the problem is if you turn that off, it can present the data in any order and the actual operating system itself or the file system itself can decide to write it in a different order. So you'll end up getting writes out of order and that will throw up your data instantly. Um, really not sure why that's even there. Uh, there's probably something I'm just not seeing that you know, is above my pay grade, but you know, again, that's, don't do it. <laughs> you might be tempted to you know, get some kind of performance boost out of it, but it's just not worth it. So the next thing we're gonna do is set up LVM. It sits on top of DRBD uh, because it actually will tell us you know, when DRBD is available. It'll protect it and gives us the ability to create snapshots and you know, all the handy things LVM does. LVM actually stands for Linux um, Volume Management. If you don't know what that is, I'd strongly suggest looking it up and reading all about it. It's very awesome. Uh, if you ever wanted to get uh, you know, 
sand level snapshots and data so it changes underneath you and you can still get a stable data system, you know, extract of it. Well, that's what LVM does. Uh, it can let you change your volumes while they're live. Um, it can even add like disks to them and make them grow. It's not, you know, completely all that awesome, but it, it does have the ability to um, kind of do the things you really need to do with your volume throughout getting too crazy. So I'm going to go ahead and create a volume, um, a, a physical volume thing. And LVM is this PV create, physical volume create. I'm telling it the BRBD, the, the thing that I just created, is I want, it to, I want it to watch and monitor. You only do this on the primary node, thankfully, because this stuff actually will carry over with the file system. It's written into the file system itself. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a volume group. Uh, now, a volume group can be split up into multiple volumes. And you can actually have multiple physical volumes in a volume group. So I could have like, you know, five disks in a volume group and then create one giant volume out of them or a hundred smaller volumes. It's a really good way to uh, kind of control, abstract your, your actual volumes away. So I'm creating a volume group, this underscore PV, um, out of the BRBD physical volume I just created, successfully created. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a 450 node actual logical volume. Now, remember when I said it was uh, it was actually 500? Well, I'm saving 50, you know, for stuff. Um, anything you don't allocate can be used to create more volume, or you can use it for snapshots, uh, which is pretty handy if you want to say uh, that, that size is actually, um, what will happen is when you create a snapshot, the data that gets written to your disk, instead of being written to the actual spot where you're are, it gets written to the snapshot. So you can actually read from the snapshot and get your get your data before it is sent. Um, it, it does it in the background. The snapshot you actually mount is it's unsaving data, but it writes it in the background so it's, it's, it's actually saving. So it's, it's, it's kind of con con convoluted. But the thing is, however big the snapshot is, is how much data your data can change while the snapshot's mounted. So obviously the longer it's mounted, the more changes it will accrue, and if that reaches the uh, maximum size of your snapshot, what will happen is the snapshot will deallocate, and you'll lose the snapshot. So theoretically, anyway, you don't lose any data, but uh, we all know that doesn't always happen in practice. So what do we do next? Well, we've got our, we've got our volume, and it's ready. We just got to put it there. Um, uh, for this particular sample, I'm going to go ahead and use um, XFS. Now, my friend Greg over here wanted me to mention that, uh, you know, XFS, if you're on a Red Hat system, is apparently an expensive add-on option. Um, I didn't realize that. I was just using it because it's handy and it's what we use, and, um, you know, we don't have um, Red Hat as a uh, vendor, so we don't really get charged by them, but um, apparently if you have a support contract that contract with them, that's the expensive way to go. Um, but I'm still going to use it in this example, um, just because. So you want a place to mount it, obviously. So, you know, PV data. And if you're going to do stuff with XFS, you're going to need the XFS props. Those are the, pro you know, format and EKFS. Those things that actually create the file system, you're going to need them. Um, so again, on the primary file system, I'm going to go ahead and format, boom, file system. And now I'm going to mount it. Now notice my options here, um, my AG count. That's handy if you have a system with lots of CPUs because with XFS, each CPU can actually write to the file system in uh, parallel. Um, it, well, it's each allocation group is parallel. Uh, unlike, say, ASP3, which only has one allocation group for the entire file system, because it only has one file table, XFS can have as many file tables as you want. Um, I just override the default to show you that you can. And again, on our primary file system, we're going to mount this. Oop, this is what's wrong. All right, so we're mounted. And I want Postgres to own the mounted version 
the code is supposed to have historical value. And that has to be All right, so now what we have Tilted pillars is really the thing. All right, so next thing we're going to do is we're going to start Postgres, which you know kind of gets proved that the data is on is going to be on both nodes, and it's going to sync across both nodes. Um, I'm going to mention a couple of caveats about um, Ubuntu here. Um, so when you do get the actual install, you're going to want Postgres 9.1 and the contrids. Contrids are actually where PG Benchmark. So, you know, for this particular purpose, that's why I need that. Um, the other thing is that I've already done is uh, when, when you install the Postgres stuff, all it, it creates a default config that it calls in there. Um, well, we want to make a new one that actually points to different direct data directories. The, the main data directory actually points to, like, var lib Postgres something to boot. Uh, clearly, it's not UDB either. So we're going to go ahead and uh, I already dropped this. And the other thing we're going to do on both systems, um, and I'm going to say why in a minute, is actually create the new HACG configuration file. All right, so this is on node two. And what I'm going to do on node two, the only reason I do this is because now I have a config file that's the same on both nodes. I don't care about that part. I just want to install. So I've got, the, I've got the same config on each server now. And again, just like I did with the RBD, I don't want the system to manage itself. This is pacemaker's territory. Step on toes here. Again, Postgres is ignored. Postgres is ignored. And here's the start Postgres. Um, oh, it's got a typo. All right, frying Ray. Uh, so the other thing I'm going to do here, and uh, you'll excuse my horrible overuse of SC here, I'm going to create a PG Bench database. I'm going to initialize it with a simple, I mean, it's only 500 megs, right? I can't really just use all that room up. Um, PG Bench will help us kind of make some fake data for the beyond this point. Um, just to initialize it with a set of five. Yay, we're creating data. OK, now we're to the really fun part. So all of that was just to get the stuff up and running. Now we have Postgres on one node. It's ready to switch over to the other node when we, when we actually want to flip over. Um, pacemaker is the hard part. Um, all that was just you know preparation at that point. So the parts that you're really going to want to watch for, and this is true with both um, Red Hat and uh, Ubuntu and any totally any Debian or Red Hat based system, is Core Sync and Pacemaker are the two bits to make this work. Total sync is uh, kind of like the transmission glue. It's basically the interface layer that works over UDP that says, okay, cluster, cloud, you know, these are the configs you're all going to use. Um, if you join the cloud, these are the configs you should, you should connect with. These are the services you should have running. These are the things you should check these for. Um, it basically is the management layer between everything. So you're going to want those. Um, and before I forget, Obviously, I can't listen to dot thirty unless I'm listening to localhost one. All right. Uh, then I want to 
ดือนหนึ่งเราเริ่มต้นกันแล้วขอให้แจ้งให้ทราบว่าเราเริ่มต้นกันแล้วขอให้แจ้งให้ทราบว่าเราเริ่มต้นกันแล้วขอให้แจ้งให้ทราบว่าเราเริ่มต้นกันแล้วขอให้แจ้งให้ทราบว่าเราเริ่มต้นกันแล้วขอให้แจ้งให้ทราบว่าเราเริ่มต้นกันแล้วขอให้แจ้งให้ทราบว่าเราเริ่มต้นกันแล้วขอให้แจ้งให้ทราบว่าเราเริ่มต้นกันแล้วขอให้แจ้งให้ทราบว่าเราเริ่มต้นกันแล้วขอให้แจ้งให้ทราบว่าเราเริ่มต้นกันแล้วขอให้แจ้งให้ทราบว่าเราเริ่มต้นกันแล้วขอให้แจ้งให้ทราบว่าเราเริ่มต้นกันแล้วขอให้แจ้งให้ทราบว่าเราเริ่มต้นกันแล้วขอให้แจ้งให้Uh, remember how I mentioned I was setting up a VirtualBox. I also set up a VirtualBox um, network, and it gave me 192.168.26. Whatever. That's what my network mask is. Well, it takes the network mask into consideration, and what it does is it sets up a multicast also on this port. So basically, anything with this configuration that joins the cloud um, with you know the UDP traffic for this configuration will show up automatically in the cluster. The other thing I'm going to do is the actual CoralSync default file. It tells it when to start up. That's set to no right now, because obviously we just installed it. Um, the default for the service is not to start. It's a pretty complicated service, and it would it needs to be properly configured over and over, and it doesn't do anything yet. So I've got a handy sed command that will change that for us from no to yes, because I want it to start. I'm actually going to start it now on both servers. Okay, on Node 2, I'm going to start. I'm going to start a service call, a, a monitor called CRM underscore mon. It's a real handy utility, kind of like Top. It basically monitors the state of the cluster and says, okay, what what do I have in the cluster? What's there? What can I use? And it always shows the current state. So now I've got two nodes online that it found. So remember, Coral Sync, they're both having, they both have the same network configuration. They're both kind of glued, latched onto the same thing. If I added a third node with the same configuration, it would also show up in the system online right now. Now we're going to get to the nitty-gritty parts that uh, I kind of hate discussing. So, first of all, there's some defaults you need to set up for Pacemaker so that it doesn't get wonky. So, Pacemaker is a enterprise-level tool. It really wants to manage your stuff and make sure it doesn't break. So, there's a thing called Stonus, which stands for Shoot the Other Node in the Head. Funny acronym, but what it actually means is when it says When it decides that a node is down, it, by default, will do whatever it can to make that node unavailable permanently, and that can be that can include shutting the power off because there's network interfaces you can actually connect to, and there's services you can actually configure it for to disconnect the network, shut it down permanently, go over a, uh, uh, a network interface to actually disconnect an entire switchboard. There's you can there's actually services that can do any of this stuff. And basically, what that means is, if you have a really big, you know, giant cluster, you don't want other nodes to pop up unannounced and start screwing with things until you've gotten to them to make sure they're not, you know, because um, they were they were turned off for a reason, right? You don't want them to come back up and start screwing things up. So, but with our two-node system, we don't care. It's also a VM, so we still don't care. And setting up a Stonus is actually pretty hard. That's one of the things that uh, when you're setting up a Stonus, uh, when you're setting up a uh, Pacemaker, it's just more trouble than it's worth for right now for this particular demonstration. So when you, if you ever set this up, read up on it, um, get a, a Unix admin that knows its stuff, because uh, it's going to be kind of crazy. 
we're going to turn it off. We only need to do this once because the configuration gets distributed to all nodes, right? It doesn't show up in here because, um, you know, whatever, but I can do this. And it shows my config, so I got storage enabled bump, right? The other thing I'm going to do is quorum policy. What quorum policy means is that if you're a, if you're a fan of Evangelion, you know, we had, we had Malchior, Balthazar, those, the supercomputers that was actually controlling the entire nerve center of the system. Well, they get to vote on what they do, and each machine gets a vote. Well, when a two-node system is around, a vote doesn't mean anything, does it? Right? Because each node will vote for itself. So we're going to go ahead and turn off quorum policy because it's pretty much meaningless. Um, so what I did there is I shut that off. You'll see here we've got um, no quorum policy is enabled. So basically, the, the cluster will still operate even though there's no quorum. Um, basically, you'll need to do this for any cluster you set up that has um, less than half nodes available, and you still want it there. The other thing we're going to do, and this is the part that uh, you could miss because you don't really, um, the thing is, pacemaker is meant to be transient. It you can basically configure it to move services over so you have a, you know, you want Apache running and you want, you know, CHD on certain nodes. It can actually move those around where it seems convenient at that time based on the score involved. Well, you definitely don't want that to happen with Postgres and you definitely don't want that to happen with your CRPC. So we're just going to set a sticky here. It's a very low level. We're basically saying if a service is running on a node, a loan. If another node comes up that you think is a better match, who cares? We'll move it later. If it, we'll, we'll move it over there if we really want it to be there. Um, those things really need to be set if you have a two-node system, right? If you don't, what'll happen is if I'm if, I, if everything is on node two, and node one comes up, which is the default. So remember, I, I, I set up everything up on node one. Pacemaker knew that. It goes, oh, you set up everything on node one. You want it there. I'll shut down Postgres and move it over to node one now just because you brought it back up again. No, I don't want that to happen. So this is our default, and that's the one we want to keep. All right, so now we're going to start actually managing our services. And just like we built the stack from the bottom up, we're going to set up GRBD, LVM, file system, Postgres in that order. And this is actually just going to be a fun barrage of cut and paste. Uh, but I'm going to kind of explain what I'm actually going to do here. So the part here, um, these little bits and pieces, uh, what you actually have when you set up Pacemaker, um, you have various levels of items. So a primitive is actually the thing you want to monitor and control. It's basically the root core of what pa Pacemaker is meant to do. In the case of GRBD, there's a supplied thing by the vendors, of, uh, the coders who basically make GRBD that say, Okay, um, Limbit is a, is a company that basically just makes GRBD. They provide this handy dandy binary or, um, script set of stuff that manages it for us. So we're going to tell Pacemaker to use that to manage it. All these timeouts are just default. I mean, they're here. Um, I'm basically setting it up so that it monitors it every 15 seconds. Um, if it starts, it waits a couple minutes, let it think it needs to. Yada yada. These are all defaults. You can actually um, see. Uh, by the way, CRM stands for Cluster Resource Management. Um, it lets you do pretty much everything. That's all the stuff you can do with Cluster Resource Management. Within those classes, there's things available you can do. So we're just going to go ahead and use the GRBD primitive here for the one we created earlier. And again, we only have to do it on the primary node, or actually any node, because it'll just absorb it. So now what we've got is a bunch of errors. I suspect this is fun. So I added the GRBD device, but the thing is the monitor doesn't know what to do because GRBD actually is not like a regular service. It doesn't run on one node or the other. It runs on both. It's just in the different statics, 
on these nodes. So the other thing I need to do is I've got here this MS here. I'm going to clear a master-slave resource, which basically says, okay, this isn't a regular thing where you just have running on one server or another. It actually has to be promoted or demoted or you know whatever based on the actual status of it. So this will actually make it work properly. Maybe. So now notice how it says master slave, and it knows the node master no, um, node one is the master, and node two is the slave. I'm going to go ahead and clean up these errors here a little bit. Now it'll work. All right. So next got our file system. Remember how we have LVM on top of BRBD? Well, we basically have to tell it to scan through the volume group because that's actually where all the data is. And then down here, we're telling it how to mount it. So we've got, again, we got some prim uh, primitives for the LVM device and, uh, and the actual file system itself, type XFS, Mount options and some default ones. Hey Sean. Yeah. Um, you were also starting to let me talking about Admin. Okay. I'll just go through the rest of this thing real quick. Apparently, I wish I had more time. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, create the rest of this and do a quick demonstration of what it can do for me. Um, my slides are actually going to be on the wiki, just like the rest of the stuff. Uh, what I'm doing now is I'm setting up the Postgres resource monitor, um, the VIP to, cr to monitor the actual um, IP address we gave it. Uh, I'm creating a group that basically ties everything together because I want um, the volume manager, the, the file system, and everything else to kind of be in the same thing. And then, I want BRBD to follow Postgres wherever we put it. So I won't be able to do all my demonstrations, unfortunately. So I'm going to go ahead and do a failover. Watch this out here. Oops. See what I just did? Now it's running on node 2. And I can prove this because here's node 2. So it's primary, and it's mounted, okay? I'm just going to cut this short. I actually had some other demonstrations where I, you know, I actually killed my VM, and it automatically migrated it, and I brought the VM back, and it didn't migrate it over. Like, I, you know, just for the stickiness work. Um, this is all, again, in the, in the liner notes. I really wish I had two hours about this. Um, darn it, I just explained too much of this stuff tried to kind of explain why I was doing this stuff so I wasn't just a cut and paste fiesta. Um, but what you're basically left with is this. Um, and I'll skip through these. And at the end of the note, and at the end of the liner notes again, is all the little bits. All these little pieces of documentation are all what goes into this. Like uh, the LSD init script is the most important thing because if you don't have something that's Linux standard based compliant, um, Pacemaker will not have the right exit codes because you have to say exit with status level three if you're shutting down a service on your PC, things like that. Um, if you don't have an LSD compliant script, it won't work. So I guess that's it for me. But 